like when they say you're you're sweating like a whore in a church, the church was inside of her. It's, it's kind of. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I'm Michelle Rose Dome, and I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm Carlos Moore, and I'm on Long Island in New York. And I'm Monica Lynn, and I'm in Miami, Florida. And we love classic films. And we're best and, friends. And- Yes, and now we're doing the ultimate classic movies vlog just for you. Each week, we give you a behind-the-scenes breakdown of classic films that only three theater people in love with films can give you. And we are... Blake 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 Yeah! Cheers, my babies. Okay, if you haven't already done so, like and follow us on Instagram and or YouTube. Flick of time. We go into details of the film, so spoiler alert ahead. (laughs) You want to still listen to us and then watch the film, that's totally okay. We're just letting you know. Spoilers. (laughs) Now let's get into this week's topic, our film. It's a foreign film. It is eight and a half. Woo! In 1963, Italian surrealist comedy, drama directed by none other than Federico Fellini, co-scripted by Fellini as well. We have starring in it Marcello Mastroianni, Car- uh, Claudia Cardinal, Anouk Ami, we have Sandra Milo, and it was distributed by Sinaris in Italy, and then in the U.S., Columbia Pictures. Mm-hmm. Mm. In Italian, the title is Otto e Mezzo, and it is pronounced as such, and we mentioned that it was co-scripted by Fellini, uh, Tullio Pinelli, Ennio Flaniano, Flaiano, there we go, <laughs> and Brunello Randi. <laughs> Help me. It stars Marcello Mastroianni as Guido um, Anselmi, a famous Italian film director who suffers from stifled creativity as he attempts to direct an epic sci-fi film. We can, we've all been there. <laughs> it is shot in black and white by cinematographer Giovanni Di uh, Venato and features a soundtrack by Nino Rota with costume and set design by Piero Gerardi. What a mouthful. <laughs> Woo! All what? the continents. All the continents. <laughs> Our next one's going to be Greek. <laughs> uh, all right. Fast. <laughs> right, that's the best tongue twister. All the Italian words. Uh, our questions are as follows. First and foremost, ladies, do we think this is an adaptation? Uh-uh. Uh, no. 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 No, it is not. No, it is not. According to Italian writer Alberto R. Bassino, Bellini's film used similar artistic procedures and had parallels with Musil's 1930s novel, The Man Without Qualities. Oh. So it has some basis on the 1930s novel. However, it was its own original. The basis was also later on the Broadway musical Nine, which class project in Lehman Ingalls BMI Music Theater Workshop in 1973. So first it was a workshop. Then it was later developed, as they do, with a book by Mario uh, Frarti, and then again with a book by Arthur Copit. The story is based also on Federico Fellini's semi-autobiographical 1963 film, which is what we get into today, and a half. Um, and then later there was the 2003 Broadway revival with Antonio Banderas and Jane Krakowski, oh. who would go on to win Best Performance featuring an actress as well as Best Revival. Woo! It's on, look it up. It's hilarious. It's wonderful. Oh, she's so, so good. good. She's I, so good. She I did that. I did her main song. Air. Oh my goodness. I did that song for an audition and I got the part. Oh, what? Yes, yeah, she did. It's such a good <laughs> song. Mm. It's so much fun. We're talking about Carla's solo, Call yeah. from the Vatican. Yeah. Right, look it up. It's worth your time. It is. All right, as far as clear and captivating plot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the influences of earlier Italian directors, I got to mention them. We have De Sica, who did Adventures of Pinocchio, as well as Visconti, who is well known for doing Italian theater and opera. These directors would be precursors to that of Fellini. So those were his influences. Huh. So for me, I certainly noticed more operatic at times, more theatrical at times, the cinematography. Agree? 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, also, like most Italian films of the time, um, it was completely recorded without sound while on set. That's wild. No what? sound. All the dialogue was dubbed during post production. That's mm-hmm. why it's off. The word. Yeah, thinking- for sure. For sure, That's it's off. Wild. So, feel a little bit like an anime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. Fellini was known for shouting direction at his actors <laughs> during shooting and rewriting, rewriting dialogue afterwards, making a lot of the dialogue in the movie appear out of sync. And that source was High Def Digest. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dynamic and smooth, needless details. Yes. I don't think there are details in this film. I agree. I think everything was done on purpose. Um, yeah. Sometimes I thought certain scenes dragged, but it was only because I was confused. So, yeah. I, like, I, I accepted it, knowing that, you know, this was a surreal film, that we're, in, we're seeing a lot of his uh, dreams or fantasies or daydreams. So, like, I, I accepted a lot of what I thought took too long, but then I realized later... It was all done on purpose, and I learned to be patient with myself during this film. There you go. Note for our viewers out there as well. Right. All right, similar films. Oh, wait, wait, before that, rating. So this film is not rated, which means our audience is... Everyone? Everyone. People that are into film, people that are into Italy, people that are into the 1960s, people that are into black and white and color films, fans of the best of cinema, as we will get into in the trivia all can come to appreciate this film. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So similar films, do they exist? Yes, yes. they do. Here we go. Um, as we mentioned on our Instagram, we see some influences in Pulp Fiction. But even yep. earlier, let's take it back to 1980 with Woody Allen with Stardust Memories. Oh, wow. I've Let's never see. seen it, but... If you're a Woody yeah. Allen fan, it's definitely up there on the list. Uh, the, street, the Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. That's in 1972. Mm. That's a Luis Bunel. Um, we have All That Jazz, which is a Fosse film, 1979. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Beyond the Sea, which is the Bobby Darren biopic. That was 2004. And then, of course, Nine, the film adaptation of the Broadway musical in 2009, as well as The Great Beauty, which was 2013. And it's influenced a lot of cinema over the past few decades. I saw a few interviews with Scorsese, who's a huge fan of this movie. And so a lot mm-hmm. of the films that we grew up watching were actually influenced by this film, which I thought was cool. Yeah, right on. With um, Guido in particular, because Guido is such a tortured character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's Fellini! Yeah. That's, that's his life. That's Fellini, yeah. which we're going to get into. And for the most part, like, being tortured or conflicted is pretty relatable so it's a it's a good movie to draw from (laughs) absolutely okay so our fun facts our trivia here we go um the film and release dates so we're looking at may 9th 1962 to the 14th of october 1962 and then it was released in italy february 13th and then in the u.s june 24th Mm. in that year 1963 our filming locations, which we got into on our Instagram. So we discuss the EUR, which is a residential district of Rome, as well as Villaciano, which is a commune in Italia, in Italy, as well as Ostia, as well as Viterbo, as well as Flumicino. You're getting as really well good as at this. Rome. Every time. Red leather, yellow leather. <laughs> Rome. <laughs> uh, another uh, the capital of Lazio which we'll get into in a second uh, Tivoli and Lazio which would also be the place of Cinchita Studios which was their sound stage so all, o- all over Rome you want that Italy you want those beautiful those beautiful landscapes bam this film got you so the film's working title was actually La Bella Confusione which translates to the beautiful confusion. So, Monica, you're right there. Yeah. <laughs> the idea for Eight and a Half actually took years to de- fully develop in Fellini's imagination. The frustration and absurdity of the process actually informed the film as we know it today, uh, centered around the protagonist, his suffering from writer's block to making the film. 
So why eight and a half? Why did they right, choose so, that title? So eight and a half actually references the number of movies that Fellini had directed up until this point. Um, we had six features, two short films, and a co-directed film with Alberto <laughs> Latuada. So the total would be eight and a half. Eight and a half. So yeah, yeah. it's the the title itself is autobiographical in nature. Boom. Because mm-hmm. nowhere throughout the film do they ever mention the title. It's never right. Suggested. It's not. There's not like deep exposition. No. So it's his eight and a half film. Yes. Very cool. chronologically, and right. they round it up for sake of the Broadway musical and the film. <laughs> Nine. Right. Simple. <gasps> oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> 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 mind blown emoji totally. Just <laughs> cool oh my goodness How so the, the thing was is that uh, Fellini had just come off of doing La, La Dolce Vida and that had huge acclaim in the 1960s um, he was the subject as a result of a lot of gossip, a lot of envy, and according to a friend biographer Tulio uh, Ketchik, as a result the rumor spread that um, he was facing a creative block and out of ideas. And in that summer in 1961, he embarked on a tour of Italy to get inspired to regroup, claiming that he was scouting location for his next film, um, which he would shoot in October of that same year. Honestly, no one believed him. <laughs> um, and as reporters began to question Fellini about his next project, increasing with vigor, he began to retreat from the public eye, even avoiding conversations with his friends and colleagues. Even the crew on which Fellini regularly developed grew very skeptical of his next project and reaching his peak frustration, Fellini even began, but ripped up, a letter to the producer confessing that he would give up on the film. He almost got to that point. Um, In half, as we know, it was shot like almost all Italian movies. We talked about the sound, that the dialogue was dubbed. Um, obviously the film goes on to be revered. It was the top 10 on BFI's list of top 50 greatest films of all time. Yeah. Ranked number two in 2002. It dropped to number four in 2012. So that was a good run. <laughs> uh, 45 best films made before 1995 on the Vatican's compilation. Hey. Yeah. Wow. David Lynch's favorite film. David Lynch, he was the director of Mulholland Drive, Velvet, Dune, Twin Peaks. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Roger Ebert, he includes this on his great movies list, praising the memorable performances, as well as the psychological depths of the themes and the striking visuals and inventive camera work. Hmm. In some respects, he said also that uh, the lead Guido, he resembles Leopold Bloom and or the hero of James Joyce's Ulysses. I Lord think that... Souls. I think Guido looked like David Bowie. <laughs> I see photo. it. I see it's it. In the photo. Golden years. <laughs> and a half, uh, yeah, Guido, eight and a half. Some photos. I was like, I'm, I'm one. When I first started researching this film, I thought it was David Bowie, and I was like, wait, that's not possible. Do we want to show Guido? Do we want a screen share? Uh, sure. <laughs> While she's pulling that up, we will continue. Philosopher and critic Dwight McDonald, for example, insisted that it was the most brilliant, varied, and entertaining movie since Citizen Kane. And by the way, everyone, that's 1941. So 1941 to the 60s, this is the best film since. Wow. As wow. according to this social critic. Wow. As you can see here, look at this. This is Guido. Do you see it? Do you see the David Bowie? Yeah. Marcello Mastroianni. So today, Eight and a Half is often ranked as one of Fellini's best works and indeed as one of the world's top films of all time. It remains a treasured artifact of Italian and world cinema. So funny enough, the film, I would say, and we'll, we'll get into this more, uh, has for that tone that uh, is very dramatic. Uh, I'm not surprised. Operatic is an influence. Um, Fedra, uh, Fellini, it's noted that he attached a note to himself below the camera's eyepiece, which yeah. read, remember, this is a comedy. Right. <laughs> I thought that was really, really interesting. Because... Yes. Now we can... Yes. It didn't, it didn't feel like comedy, but they 
filmed it as such. Correct. Interesting. It didn't feel like a comedy at all. No, no, definitely not. Um, at one point, Fellini wanted to cast Laurence Olivier in a lead role. Huh. Whoa. Can you imagine Guido, this guy, as Laurence Olivier? Yeah. <laughs> Lawrence Olivier. All right. I think he was perfectly cast, honestly. I really enjoyed Guido's character. Mm. I also have photo, a photo of Fellini. Yes. Yes. Um, which, which brings me to the point in searching for that actor that would play our lead, um, the, the protagonist. Fellini was actually looking for a human mirror, someone who can reflect his own image. Let's show Fellini. Now that we've had a good shot of our current Guido. Boom. I mean, a little more like Hitchcock, personally. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> he does not mm. look like that main character to me. <laughs> <laughs> Fellini chose admired thespian Marcello Mastroianni, who had already performed a leading role in La Dolce Vita, his last film, huh. Hello but was too nervous to approach Fellini about the new projects. Um, so it wasn't as though an actor appealed to the director in this case, as we have past expressed in Sophie's Choice, but rather uh, Fellini just saw his own image in the lead. Despite oh, wow. his timid respect for Fellini, um, said lead would go on to play roles in four more of his films and is still associated with Fellini's wow. persona on the big screen today. Mm. So will as we continue to watch Fellini's movies, we'll run into the same actors. Yes. As is common. Absolutely. As is very common, you will see posses travel in various films, specifically comedy. But I would say in a lot of films, you tend, friends tend to hire friends. They want to work sure. with their friends. True. And plus, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know all that. There's a trust. Yes, exactly. That trust is so important. Um, the characters of the film were based on Fellini's colleagues. Mario and Gloria, for example, were based on the film producer Carlo Ponti and his wife, actress, Sophia Loren. Ugh. Ugh. He's still gorgeous. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now. Yeah. Still so gorgeous. Shout out. <laughs> Um, so despite being top credited, Claudia Cardinal has barely some eight minutes of screen time in the whole movie. She was a prominent character. She just wasn't there very much. Yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like mm. she was an important character. She right. was mm -hmm. almost a hovering ghost in a sense. Yeah. Was, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a note to Fellini, he was well known for working without a stable finished screenplay. At one point during pre-production, he had completely forgot what his next work would have been about. His original idea had completely gone. So while he was set to communicate to the movie producer, Angelo Rizzolo, Rizzoli, excuse me, his intention of abandoning the project, Fellini was invited to the birthday party of a head camera operator of Cinchita. All of a sudden, during the celebration, he got a new idea. His film would have told about a film director who was going to direct a film, but he forgot what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I, I don't think it's common to work in that process nowadays. Not at all. Not at all. But it was well known with Fellini. If you're going to work for Fellini, you got to be willing to roll with that. Right. Pun intended. Wow. <laughs> During the rehearsal scene, the love theme from The Godfather can be heard on the piano. The music for In a Half was composed by Nino Rota, who composed the music for The Godfather, among numerous other films. How about that? What? That's awesome! Hey, I wonder what song that was. <laughs> okay. Because of a strike. Oh, go ahead. I've never seen The Godfather. If you see it, I don't know that I would recommend the third. I'm of that cloth. It's awful. Just watch one and two and you're fine. Really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, three suck. Sorry, I said it. Three's awful. <laughs> awful. <laughs> awful. You heard it here first about the third. Sorry, Godfather creators. May they rest if they're still around. You know, we said what we said. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Because of a strike at the development and print lab at Chinchita during post-production, uh, Fellini was unable to check the daily shoots, or the dailies as we call them. He reportedly never took vision 
of the filmed material until the movie editing phase. Whoa. That's a lot of trust. Yeah. <laughs> wow. He never saw the dailies? Never. That's that is crazy. Tr- Part of the process. Well, everyone has their process. True. Uh, originally, the famous ending of the film was shot with the intention of using it in the film's trailer. What? Not oh. in the film. Just in mm. the trailer. Hmm. Just in the trailer, but no, they loved it so much. I wonder what part. Was it the part where he's under the table and he has the gun? The, end, the parade. The parade. Like, and they're walking, in a, they're walking yes. around. Yes. In a circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The film was so popular, in fact, that one company wanted to mass produce the black hat that Guido wears. <laughs> cool, they should have. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> and that's that'll great. do it for our trivia. If you want to know more trivia, check out our Instagram, Flicka Time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and now, onward, we march in getting into our favorite scenes, quotes. What stood out for you? So the movie starts with a very quiet minute. And I had no idea when I saw the movie, when I started the movie, what to expect. Uh, so I I was confused. I was like, is this a silent film? I was very confused. And my confusion continued throughout the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I, I don't think even Bellini knew what he was doing. He was like <laughs> flying by the seat of his pants, like, sure, yeah, sure. looks good, great. <laughs> I don't know. It gave off that impression, though. Yeah. So, kind of. yes. I, I was uneasy throughout the movie, which mm. affected m- my enjoyment of the movie. And it wasn't until after that I could start to appreciate what I was watching. Mm. Um, so, I had a challenging time. As a millennial who watches a short clips of things, I being frustrated and confused as to what I was watching was not easy. So for viewers today, I think it would be a lot more challenging to see this movie. Mm. At least that was my experience. That's an interesting way to put it. I actually, I, I appreciate this about foreign films um i appreciate the language barrier and um because i think it forces me to focus yeah (laughs) as a millennial um i think it actually does force me to just turn my phone off and focus on what i'm watching a little bit more there are times where i'll rewatch a film but i know what's going on so i'll just have it playing in the background and i'll re-listen you know this does not have that luxury with a film like this. So I did appreciate that aspect. I was very confused um, a lot as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, there were, I guess, I didn't, wasn't sure if there were like flashbacks or dream sequences. Right. It felt there were, or reality. I was, I, I did have moments of confusion, um, especially around, uh, especially the scene when the reporters were bombarding him with questions and he just starts right. crawling uh, I was like, is this real life right now? And it was. Right. It's just... It, but it, I, it moments was, taken from his real I, life, yeah? I appreciate that. It wasn't until later on in the film that I started to accept that my confusion is probably what he, the director, Fellini, was, was going for. Was going for. So that's when I started to ease into it. Realizing mm-hmm. that the dream sequences are almost blurred into reality. Yeah. And that's his everyday reality. Yes, yes. I would say it likened itself to Pi and other films that I would call think pieces. Right. This falls under that category for sure. I didn't when even the lines know, are blurred. I didn't even know that surrealism existed in film until this one. And um, yeah. I, I, I only know for, you know, visual art, like painting Dali, of course, um, Salvador Dali, very, you know, prominent example but I I didn't even know and then as I'm thinking like oh that makes sense and I had other films that popped into my mind like oh that might be considered surrealism as well Mm -hmm. and it never even occurred to me so that was pretty pretty cool um I think that his confusion 
was supposed to be our confusion as well, because he was a man who was just like, what am I doing? Yeah. And we're like, doing. <laughs> I think every age, audience and filmmaker. I thought it was really interesting. The character of the critic that mm. monologues immediately after every dream sequence because his monologue, first of all, such good writing. Yes. Uh, I love that. There's just too many good quotes from, from those monologues in specific, that one character. Uh, and I think it's a reflection of Fellini's inner monologue as director. And maybe right. Guido his inner monologue as also director in the movie within a movie or the making of a movie, right? Sure. Um, and we, so oh. I, I thought that was really, really cool how they add introspection from the director. And you can tell he's talking about his own process as director. It was really, really cool the way he did that. And that was actually touched on in our Instagram page. Um, one of the posts was, you know, the artist is their own worst critic. Um, so um, it does touch on that. It's a true um, sentiment. That's so relatable. I'm sure, I'm sure other people are, but as artists, we can relate to that. Um, yes. You know, we looking at our work or, and just beating ourselves up. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know what was my favorite shot? in the whole film, when I started to get into it, and it was early on in the film, his dream sequence, when he is holding a f someone's leg as a kite. Ah, oh, yes, yes, I yes. I love that shot. How did they even do that? So I'm not sure if it's the exact footage, but there, we're going to share this in our YouTube comments. There's actually footage from filming. It probably was around the soundstage during that time. Okay. So if you wanted to see for some of the cinematography, our audience, we're going to be sharing that, and you can check it out so you can get into the mindset. So cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really taken by uh, Guido's relationships with people, particularly. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and and seeing how his relationship with the church versus his relationship with his mom and his wife mistress and the girl that he wanted to maybe have a little go at but he couldn't because that was his friend's girl you know it was me i <laughs> that's not who monica is dressed up as hey so I'm dressed uh, up yeah. as Gloria. We can get into fashion for a second. Like, Monica, who she's dressed as, whom I'm dressed as, and Carla, yourself, who yes. you're inspired by. Um, we'll get and, into that. Yes. And um, I think that a lot of it is linked to Saragina. I think that um, Saragina was maybe a woman who introduced him to sexuality to some degree and maybe his intrigue with women and with um, just exploring them um and to the point where maybe it could have been to his demise to some degree mm. um probably added to his confusion because it's like right. well i'll chase a skirt but like what's my script about at the same i i i, I felt like there was that or maybe or women used women as a distraction and he had a whole scene of just like where he's the prince and all the women in his life the uh, countered at one point pardon the harem. Yes, the harem. The harem. Which is a dream sequence with all the women, which we yes. see before in the reality when he's in the harem with all the men. So it's like, it's really interesting how his reality starts to appear in his dream sequences, like his imagination. Really cool. The lines get blurred. Right. Okay, so we've pulled up here. It looks like a photo of, is it Louisa? Yes, this is Louisa. Right. Whom I'm inspired by. Yes. Um, she is a, the scorned woman. Uh, Guido has, oops, Guido has his, uh, he also has a mistress who shares my name, but she's Carla with a C and I'm Carla with a K. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. This is Carla with a C. I loved um, her. 
Oh, beautiful design. She was, beautiful design. She was my favorite female actor in this film. I just thought she was, she had so many mannerisms and gestures and she was just a lot of fun to watch. So expressive. Yes. Yes. Tony, she reminded me of um, a 1960s, well, I guess maybe she was coming up during that time, but the Gabor sisters, like the Holy Acres. Yeah. Do you see it? I do. I do. Yeah. Exotic. Um, yes. And I think she was very quirky and, um, despite the fact that she was cheating on her husband with a married person, there was something still pretty lovable about her. And I think the huge connection with Guido's attractions of Carla um, and uh, uh, um, Sarah Gina, I think that there was... Mm, Oh my goodness, yes. You talk about how um, Louisa was very prim and proper, uh, very conservative in her style of dress. Um, whereas Sarah Gina, very free flowing, quirky, eccentric. She was free. Yes. Oh, also, uh, Louisa was a very thin woman. She um, she had more of a twiggy type of figure. Yes. Uh, Gina and Carla were very curvy. They were like uh, more Marilyn Monroe, very uh, bodacious. Hourglass. Um, body types were very yes. different. They dressed was extremely different. Louisa was very conservative. She wore her she wore button up shirts all the way up to the top. Um, Louise, uh, Sarah Gina and Carla wore low cut tops. That's who I'm inspired by. Uh, Hello. Because <laughs> these ladies, but <laughs> um, but they you know they would wear the form fitting clothes, something a little loud. Like uh, Carla was a little loud in her style. Am I? Yes. Yes. Had, Hers, she wore, as you can see, the fur hats, the fascinators, the, you know, all that. And Sergina, she would wear the form-fitting dress. It was all ripped up, um, but you could still see her thick, curvy Thighs. figure. Her I would body. say the trade-off to the, the curves would be the intellectualism that Louisa would bring to the table. Like, Guido was a complicated character, uh, not just, uh, uh, you know, after the one thing, even though the film would lead us to believe otherwise, he in fact enjoyed for that of intellectual stimulating conversation. I think that's right. where Louisa came through. Mm-hmm. Um, or, yes, Louisa. Mm-hmm. The character that Monica, um, oops, character that Monica was inspired by, this lovely lady right here. <laughs> Seductive. She was, but I, she was a flirt, and I think she knew what she was doing. She was a smart girl. She was a very smart girl. We got into it in a past episode, the idea of femme fatale. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I see that. Yeah. She's bad girl. Mm-hmm. She is, but she's, and she's very intellectual. She's highly, actually, she's kind of a combination, if you think about it, right? She was mm-hmm. writing her thesis, she, she mentions. So mm-hmm. she's. Oh, Guido, that's probably the appeal with her. She's, um, Guido loved Luisa because of her, because she was intellectual. She was smart. She was more conservative. She was the type of girl you could probably take home to mother. Um, I love. Young lady looks the part. However, she's very conniving. She knows what she's doing. She's writing her thesis. She's going to Italy. She's meeting up with older, with an older gentleman. And Who's um, involved in film? Wasn't Mario, her boyfriend, the producer? Yes. Was her schoolmate's father. Oh. So. Yeah. I mean, I mean. She a gold digger. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I gotta let you pay the loan. <laughs> <laughs> and what, I love her. Saragina? So Saragina? Yes, Sarah yes. Gina. Oh, with that tapestry, that like, that that free flowing curtain before so the this, ocean. This was shown the second time we saw her in the film, not the first. I thought it was a flashback because it would show baby Guido or younger Guido meeting up with the boys on the beach to see Sarah Gina dance for, and then he was caught and taken and punished. Yes. Back- Is that so what like- happened? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, and actually, nine, that's that's where they took the story adaptation as well, <gasps> is that that was his early on exposure to sexuality. Mm-hmm. Ah. Formative coming of age. I see. And, 
And also keep in mind, take a look. I'm going to try to do a super zoom in of Sarah Gina's eyes. Ooh. Look at her eyebrows. Oh my goodness. Ooh. This, Such a Guido, rock star. Where Guido is, is a, with like a triangle. Make a whore face. And he drew her eyebrows up. Those are mm-hmm. her eyebrows. That's her slutty. Yes. Those are her. Which is what I say that Guido the was highly. That's the parallel. Yeah. So Carla, in some in some way, reminded Guido of Saragina. I thought that they were kind of like Eskimo sisters in a sense. And <laughs> I see that. Guido thought cool. Carla, and so that's why he was attracted to her because it took him back to that boyish attraction right. to this older woman who was just yes. wearing yes. tight clothes, showing her boobs, showing you know, showing her figure on the beach. Proud, so proud body confidence. Mm-hmm. You're, yeah. Yeah, she's not. I actually, I, I think that there was something very lovable about her, and I don't, I can't put my finger on it. It just felt like, I mean, she's so free. She was, but it, it, how can almost, that not be meritable? True. She was maternal true. in a sense, even though they sexualize her a little. Uh, she was maternal that's, because she's. I don't. Mm. That's. I think that I think that they misread her. And um, we saw her, or the way that it was filmed w- was um, that we saw her in a very sexy way. But I did not feel like, like he would say, talk to me like a whore, but, or give me a look at, or make that whore face. I did not think she was a whore at all, like at all, whatever, you know, a person's definition of that is. I didn't think of her that way. I thought she loved doing something to make these kids laugh. Yeah. Who knew? I, I kind of saw a, a little more innocent than I think Guido saw. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, because we see it from Guido's point of view, but that wasn't yes. necessarily what the character intended to do. Now that you've explained the scene to me, see, I, I'm a little bit confused, and, and you're giving me a lot of clarity just in talking it through, so this really helps. Right, um, right. This film was a little bit confusing because there's so many lines, so much is blurred that I I, yes. I struggled with it a little bit. But um, it's, it's everyone's favorite well not everyone's favorite movie but a lot of influential filmmakers come to this movie as an example of the best movie ever right yes exactly right right i understand it conceptually to have been um so influential now that i that i see it and hear their feedback in interviews but it wasn't my impression when i first saw it and i i just think that goes to show how much cinema has changed in the past 100 years even from before to now and what we're used to watching i think this is one of those movies that you can watch um over and over and every time you watch this film a huge piece of the puzzle comes you know, comes to you. Oh, that's what that was. I think right. that's, this is definitely that kind of film. Yeah. I think that happens when you watch anything anyway, but I think that this is a film that you are not supposed to watch once or twice. I think that right. it's almost like a puzzle and each time something, something just, uh, you, you, you're, you become aware of something. Um, also, I think that there was a lot of guilt um, uh, Guido was conflicted with a lot of guilt um, because he was raised Catholic. You saw the strong Catholic influence in his life from his um, from his schooling to even the guilt that he was feeling and the confusion that he was feeling between Carla and Luisa, even when Luisa wasn't around, and him trying to figure out this film. And then he right. go, um, you know, he goes to a big man in charge within the church at the you know he's he's in Rome, Italy. Um, so yes, there is, I think there was a huge distinction between Guido's, uh, daily activities and his connection to the church. And there was some underlying guilt there as well. To your point, I think contrast is a huge visual theme in this film. Yes. And even in, I mean, in the cinematography Contrast is a big deal because it's black and white, so there's big color contrasts. Uh, But also thematically, because 
you're speaking about the Pope and his relationship to Catholicism, there's this one scene towards the end. The critic is telling him Catholicism is too serious for you to be uh, uh, making jokes about it. But then, simultaneously, you hear the table in back of them, which has the Pope sitting on the table, and the Pope starts making jokes about communism. And it's, <laughs> it's Guido who notices, it's his perspective where he his attention goes from his critic giving him unsolicited advice to then uh, the Pope making very vulgar jokes, which which I think itself is a commentary on religion and yeah. uh, Guido's perspective on it. Um, I think that's really interesting how, how they shift between uh, conversations to show like what he's listening to, what his ear is on, you know, and you, yeah. you can see his opinion, Guido's opinion, about it just in his gesture reacting mm-hmm. to it so i thought i thought that was really well done also keep in mind remember when carla got really sick it was after she drank the holy water the <laughs> holy water was to help heal guido symbolic he was just getting better she drank the holy water and this girl was sick as sin so that i think that that was also nice clan words um, <laughs> Oh, thanks. I totally just realized that. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she was super sick. And I wonder if that has to, if that reflected uh, the fact that she was not, not necessarily a bad woman, but maybe a woman who was not pure in intention, in right. her actions, and the water, the holy water knew. And so maybe it was purging her of right. her, her fever. Know, her, her fever is is sin being sweated yeah, out. Her sees, you know, like when they say you're you're sweating like a whore in a church. The church was inside of her. It's, it's kind of. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. So uh, she was sweating. <laughs> you know, I really liked how they make use of first and third person for Guido's point of view because Mm. sometimes uh, Guido is the camera and everybody's looking at him especially during his dream sequences people start looking to uh, the characters in the film extras really start looking at the camera as if they're spiking the lens it's called spiking the lens in film spiking the lens okay so they're spiking the lens (laughs) When the actors like break the fourth wall and look at the camera, yeah, cool. But it's it's to show I think that it's Guido's point of view. Guido is the camera at that point, and then they switch to when you're in Guido's reality. He is par- He is a character in front of the camera. I thought that was really interesting how they shift back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um. Also, one thing that really stood out to me, and I thought it was so beautifully done was just playing with shadows and lighting. Yes. yes. When Contrast. Guido was in the car with Claudia and all you see are his eyes, just like everything else is shadowed out. I was gorgeous. Had to be. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's really, almost really. as though if they would have left certain sound out, I wouldn't complain. I wouldn't be mad about it. Yeah. That, right. That, the cinematography. Beautiful. Just the gorgeous. Way light and dark and white and black um and that was something that really stood out to me also in costume um carla wore black with white accents saragina wore black with white accents luisa's main color was white um in the uh in the harem in the harem scene most of the women were wearing white um so uh and and just seeing how they're playing back and forth between parts of his life um, that he's flashing back to or remembering and seeing what the, what color they're wearing, uh, seeing whether they're wearing black or white. And then in the end of the film, everybody is wearing white. Right. It's almost he's finally broken free from whatever yes. sin was inside of him throughout the film. And everybody was almost on the same playing field as Louisa. Mm-hmm. In Definitely. a way, they all fell into their role in his life 
Because Luisa or academia, intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And just um, they just seeing that that was he had broken free from whatever was weighing him down, and that was it was almost like everyone was the dove. It was just being released. Oh, I love that. It was, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was really well done. So he used white to show purity, holiness, um, academia, Holy like stuff. you said. Uh, but I think he also used contrasting colors because of his limitation uh, of film. It was a black and white film, so he needed to use contrasting colors so that things would stick out, you know? They couldn't do a lot of grays because then it wouldn't read against their background. So I right, think right. Uh, logistically, it was done really well. But then thematically, it was also done really well. Just like you said, it was in the costumes. It, it meant something for their costumes to be a certain color, which I think was really cool considering it's a black and white film. And you can only do black, white, and gray. Right. That's all you can play with. I, I think, and of sure. course, um, but but Claudia, for example, in his mind, before he met up with her, she was always wearing white. And then when he finally met her, she was wearing black. That is so intentional. Good catch. Huh. So, so intentional. Yeah. You know, when, he's, when he has these, like, when he was imagining Claudia in the slip dress in his hotel room, and she is, it's all white. And then when he finally says, oh, let's get this actress, and he finally goes for a drive with her, her whole outfit from head to toe is all black. And so it's now going from what I would imagine or what I would hope that you are to the reality. And the reality is never as pretty as what I imagined. Mm. It's always a little darker. Painful realism. It's, It's painful realism. It's like painful to watch his his own struggle and confusion. It, it, the film was hard to watch for me. Like, in seeing his... First of all, trying to understand what's going on because of this <laughs> absurdist, um, powerful imagery. But then also, right. as you get to know the main character, he's going through the same struggle that you are as a viewer right. of the film, which I thought was really interesting. You know what? You know how I... Um, I, I don't remember who I was speaking to somebody about this film and um, the way that I described Guido's um, idea of Claudia. It's like when you're a kid and you think that a person, a, a, an idol, a parent, whoever, someone you look up to is perfect. And then as you get older, you just realize that they're just as human as the next guy or as you. And there is such a disappointment to that hmm. because, they are perfect, that they are invincible, that they are capable of doing anything. And when you see that they are human, um, there is a level of disappointment that comes with that. And I think that that's why she was in black because mm. it was, it was disappointment. Cause it's like, ah, you're not as dreamy as I had imagined you. She was also silent when she was wearing all white. So the second she spoke and she would push back. And, mm-hmm. huh, less really perfect. good catch. Yep. I didn't even <laughs> think of that. Okay, so in terms of ratings, how would we rate this film? I have to say, Monica, you nailed it. Some of the surrealism was a little far-fetched for me, took me out of the moment. It felt as though it was being artsy for artistic sake, intellectual, like pseudo-intellectualism. Um, so that took me out of it. Um, certainly the cinematography and the fashion, the wardrobe choices brought me right on back. The shots of Italy brought me right on back. So I'm going to have to give this a seven. I am in the same vein as you, Michelle, because it took me out of it so many times, although I appreciate it for its cultural, uh, how relatable it's been in culture and how it's affected all of the cinema that we've grown up watching. I can respect this film because of that, but watching it itself was a, a struggle for me. I also rate it a seven, and seven is high. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I'm going to go a step further I'm going to rate it I'm going to give it an 8 and I say that because I think this is a great film to rewatch and rediscover or to discover 
new things every time. This film, I think that there's so much nuance yeah. in mm. the storyline and the characters in, you know, uh, the way that they interact with each other in the way that they wear their clothes. I just think that there's so much nuance and yes, it is confusing, but I think that watching it more and more, you can understand when you're in a dream, when you're in a flashback, when yeah. you're in the present. Um, and I think that this is a good film to really rewatch and rediscover and just understand it more and more as you do that. There, so I go, or even at an art installation, just to have it on. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's, in a loop. Yeah. It's beautiful. It really <laughs> is. And interesting to watch. Although frustrating when you're trying to understand it, fine, fair. <laughs> but what, is he, what did he just just say? I don't speak Italian. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, I didn't have the captions yes. for the first few oh, minutes, no! <laughs> so I was so overwhelmed until I realized <laughs> you can turn on the captions. <laughs> yeah, rewind, rewind it back, rewind it back. <laughs> I did a lot of pausing and rewatching because. Yes. Yeah. So this movie is about two hours and 20 minutes, I think it is, the running time. Mm -hmm. But for mm -hmm. me, it took me a lot longer, maybe like three, three and a half hours to get through it, just for the sake mm -hmm. of understanding it and appreciating it. There's a lot to yeah. take in. Bear that in yeah. mind, our audience. That's one of the reasons why I think it is a good rewatch. There is so much to digest. And maybe there's, I think maybe the language barrier could be a factor as well. But <laughs> um, yeah. I have a retro rewind. Yes! A retro rewind, our dear listeners, our viewers, is when there is something to the technology that occurs in the storyline that has since, in today's modern time, been revolutionized. An example of that might be a fax machine, writing letters to now emails, and so on. And in this film, there are two retro rewinds that I thought were important two to me. Them. Two of them. Uh, the first, uh, they get on a phone call, Guido, to Luisa, his wife, and there's yes. an operator on the line, which yeah, I think is right. so funny. And the operator keeps interrupting, and I think it's like one of these, right, where you speak into the and and right. And so the operator's like, uh, "Are you done yet?" <laughs> and ah, ah, can you even imagine somebody on your phone call timing you, or your phone call being of a certain length? Uh, or eavesdrop. It's so crazy. And then the second one, um, separate beds. This has nothing to do with technology, but it's totally retro. Uh, I remember uh, Lucy. Yes, I love Lucy. I Dick love Van Dyke. Lucy. They all had separate beds, and this is around the same yep. time. Guido and Luisa, mm -hmm. when Luisa comes to visit, they sleep in separate beds, which I thought was really strange especially when they're not in the same yeah. shot and she's smoking a cigarette in bed and then puts it out and I'm like what is she doing she just put it out on top of Guido until I realized <laughs> that there was a nightstand on the other side <laughs> yes coolness well this has been an absolute treat thank you all for tuning in like and follow us on Instagram and YouTube flick of time um join us next week as we discuss comedy drama American Graffiti, directed by George Lucas, yeah, cool. and starring none other than Ron Howard, Harrison Ford, Mackenzie Phillips, the list goes on and on and on. I'm so excited for this film, really. I'm yes. so excited for this film as well. And just so you guys know, we are... Lick of Lick Time! Of time. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much. See you next Thank week. You. See you next Bye. week. American Graffiti. Woo! Woo! Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Okay. <laughs> Three, two.